Zuzu Radio. Welcome to Zuzu Radio. I'm your host, Bran, and I'm here with... Silas Rubeck. Silas, thank you for being here on my show. <laughs> um, I've been a huge fan of your video work for a long time. You know, I've seen um, you operate in a lot of different spaces in a lot of different ways, whether it's music video or live projection. We'll get into all that as we go, but um, it's always so glitchy and fun and like um, just uh, surreal, abstract. Like there's a lot that pulls you in to what you're what you're doing, and so I want to. Uh, having seen it in action now, I want to go back, back to the beginning of it all, where the early days, you know, was there anything when you were growing up that really influenced your style or your taste for this glitchy thing? Uh, t- TV, television, it's cr- uh, crazy, but just like like media in general. I've, I've one, one of my friends one time described America very well, where they were saying that it's like a, a godless uh, country. And like that's one of the the big elements of America. And then like also, um, like family values are not or like are just spotty. Like it depends on where you're at. So I always feel like my big touchstone through life was like TV and watching media and stuff. Um, and then it's like also sort of the technological accelerationism of the early 2000s. Like new phone, new thing every year. Um, I think that just set like a precedent in my brain of like things needing to be fast and changing a lot. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So a product of the technology that's advancing while you're literally growing up yeah, with it. Absolutely. And um, in inside of that experience, were there any things that had like this scrambled artifact type quality where you were sort of drawn to them or like, oh, I kind of like this? Um, I think that that's the memory element. I, my, my memories are pretty scattered oh. and erratic. So I think it's it's sort of like the closest I can come to stitching my perceived experiences into the real world. It's very like, um, I was just reading a thing about it, uh, alienation or like, um, God, estrangement. That's what it was. Mm. This uh, estrangement of, of like the reality and like the place that you're in. Yeah, yeah, and internally, memories feel like that sort of a strange, fragmented, uh, jumble, garble of information. Absolutely, yeah. I moved here from Colorado when I was very young, and I mean, I don't think that that is directly influential, but a lot of people I've talked to that have also moved when they were young say that they're, they they find it harder to like have uh, cemented memories and things like that. Oh, that's interesting. Um, and that could be like a case by case thing, but that's definitely like I feel like. And with just like the way it feels like time. I mean, everyone talks about it now, but things are always have always always feel like they're moving faster. But there's like a sense of Mm -hmm. reality and time being kind of more warped now than ever. Yes, definitely. Definitely. Some pandemic uh, disruption. (laughs) But I'm with you on this whole moving when you're young thing. Um, so what brought you away from Colorado? I imagine you came to Buffalo from Colorado? Yeah, absolutely. What was the... Uh, well, I was four and I wasn't smoking enough weed, so they kicked me out. And I thought that was kind of ridiculous. I was like, okay, um, I think they'd let me back in now. Um, but also my mom wanted to pursue nursing and my dad grew up here. So oh, okay. that was probably a, a, a secondary part apart from me getting, uh, deported. Yes. A little family <laughs> tie to the area. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. My dad moved out there to ski. Um, and then, uh, my mom moved there from California when she was younger. I don't know the specifics of that too well. Are either of your parents, um, artists or even visual artists? Um, not particularly. My parents' biggest influence on me artistically was that, uh, they played Tom Waits when I was a child, like mm-hmm. very, very young. What did that do to you? <laughs> I, who knows? I mean, that's the real question. I think that's what I'm, I think that's what the, that's what we're exploring now. That's right. We're here to take that apart. <laughs> exactly. He's a little scary uh, for kids, maybe. <laughs> um, but I agree. he's an incredible artist. And uh, talk about jamming ideas together. I heard a story about Tom Waits that he used to ride in his car with um, two radios and the radio that was built in, mm. and he'd be turning them between stations and trying to get them all to line up in an interesting way to inspire what he was going to do next. That's genius. And when you think about that, a lot of what you hear from him makes sense. It's just like Absolutely. collaged. No, for sure. I, I heard an interview once where he talked about um, directing musicians, where he wouldn't give them like notation or anything really musically based or like anything theory based. It would just be like, dance like you're a plumber in a leotard. <laughs> and that would be his like whole shtick for the tuba player. And then that's like, 
I think that's a great, interesting well to draw from as well. Definitely. It's so different than, um, you know, here's the sheet music, play it. Yeah, it's like, absolutely. no, you're opening this like door that yeah has maybe been locked forever. That kind <laughs> of prompt is really cool. Um, so now that I know that your parents, you know, played you Tom Waits, which was definitely influential, but they weren't exposing you to visual artists, right? Not necessarily, no. I, they were both like doing their own thing, I would say. And so how did you, was there anyone that showed you the ropes or like a lot of times, uh, maybe this is just me, but music seems more accessible than um, the technology you might need to master to do some of the work that you're doing. Mm. Um, and it's just maybe more prevalent in like a youth culture where it's like, oh, this guy has a guitar. So maybe, <laughs> but you didn't pick music. You, you, you're you kind of parallel to it, but you picked this visual artist thing. And I'm just so curious, like, when did it happen where you're like, yeah, I want to do that? Um, the visual art thing, I think, is like an evolution, very like similar to like, I think my tastes in general, like we're super... I'm super blessed to have grown up in a time where like internet was the way it was and like things were evolving in the way that I was uh, surrounded by. Like one of the things I, I, I reminisce about that so few people can relate to is um, Apple Radio, which was like a brief pre-Apple Music iTunes era um, application for phones that was like a Pandora based uh, like a algorithm where it would get oh. you would you could only you couldn't listen to an album you could listen to like a radio based on an album I see okay. uh, so one of the other uh, CDs my parents had was the Juno soundtrack so that made me listen to Kim Yu Dawson and the Moldy Peaches which then led me into the whole anti folk folk punk genre which then led me into like as well as like you know hipster culture happening so in my young impressionable mind i was like i can't ever watch a movie that anyone likes <laughs> like i can only watch weird stuff on the internet with my friends that no one's ever heard of so those two things kind of meshed in a way where it was like spending a lot of my uh youth like forming a taste and like mm -hmm. finding what i liked uh in media and like getting really obsessed with certain things and then while that was all happening, it was like, okay, I like drawing. Okay, I like animating. Okay, I like making videos. Okay, I like shooting B-roll. <laughs> um, and those things like building up and up and up on each other till it was like, okay, I want to make a music video because I would like watch music videos on YouTube all day and be like, oh, this is so interesting. This shot is so interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, the people making these are doing so much creatively and like, the only thing stopping me from doing that is not knowing musicians or like not working with musicians. Um, so then it, I would like reach out to people like um, Muddle, which I knew uh, yeah. some of the people uh, from high school. And then I reached out to them and was just like, hey, I totally make music videos. Like, <laughs> let me make you a music video. And then they're like, OK, cool. And I was like, I'm going to have to hang out with you a couple for a little while to do that. And then basically just like spent a year hanging out with them, shooting what they did. And then was like, OK, got to make a music video out of this now. So they were the very first client of yours. The very first client and like very much like like uh, sort of conned my way into that through the Instagram DMs of like, I definitely know what I'm doing. That's a pro <laughs> tip right there, though. I mean, if you pretend like you know what you're doing so well that people don't know that you don't know what you're doing. Absolutely. <laughs> you're in a yeah. good position to learn and get experience. I mean, I mean it kind of sounds a little like a con man thing, but I think in a way it's um, you have to be bold to get in. Yeah, and absolutely. so there are times where when I was starting the label, I would uh, sign off emails and I would like have like a team of people. <laughs> and those team of people were just people I was like, I'm just going to put your name down. Is that cool? <laughs> and, you know, and it looked good. Uh, and it got you in. So that, that's really interesting. And how did the video turn out that you made for Mike? Pretty good. I like that one a lot. I think that the, the, those early videos are really interesting because it was before I had really discovered any of the technology that I use in my process now. Oh. Or even like any of the techniques that I use in my process now. But you can still see me like trying to do those things. Like okay. there's certain visual effects and elements where it's like, okay, you're totally trying to do this thing now that would have looked so much better if you did it this way. But your process at the time was like all of the pre-built like uh, Adobe Premiere plugins. Mm. So it was just like luma keying everything and a ton of layers and yes. things like that. Do you look back at that work now and 
um, I hate to put it this way, but a lot of my students uh, in my music production class will make a song, weeks will go by, they'll listen to that song from weeks ago and cringe. Mm. And it's like a good sign in a way because you're developing as an artist. It's unfortunate to have like a negative reaction to something you put a lot of time into, but I'm curious, what's your relationship to the work in this previous iteration of your style? When I am looking at my previous work, I think I go through that cringing phase halfway through making it. Like, oh, especially with music during. videos. Um, like, there's a, a you listening to this song over and over again, mm. and like, you have this really strong idea at the beginning, and then you're like fully just putting on the construction labor hat by the middle. <laughs> yeah. And you're like, I hate this riff, actually. <laughs> I, I love it live, but like, they screwed up the record. Like, just like nonsense, yeah. honestly. Things yeah. that like no one's really noticing, but you are because you're like, gotta get the mouth to line up with this line on the video oh my god i know you've <laughs> probably heard the song more than the band's ever heard it yeah yeah it, uh, maybe the only person who's heard me more as much heard that part of the song as much as like whoever mixed it you right know? <laughs> so like for the muddle ones that would be you yeah <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i know what you mean totally though that's pretty interesting but when i look back at my old work i love i genuinely pretty much love it okay oh that's good the only things i don't like are like if there's someone in the video that like i have had a falling out with mm. but that's personal it doesn't really affect how i feel about the video i'm pretty pragmatic about like uh, oh wow i like what i was going for here i can see how i did this wrong i like this part mm -hmm. yeah you the only way to get better is to make stuff that you fail at and then realize how to solve the problem you know like absolutely next time i know how to get around that it's yeah definitely yeah important. definitely yeah yeah like learning is is like the learning process of making stuff is yeah so, is so important and you can't learn without doing the project mm -hmm. and then so you're like, like roped into this oh i'm gonna complete this thing and maybe later i'll realize oh i could have done it differently yeah there's this uh like crazy adrenaline like like intense fear and also joy when I'm shooting usually a short film where I'm like, am I getting what I need? Do I even know if I'm getting what I want? Absolutely. When you're shooting these things, um, before we sort of transition into the ones we're going to talk about, how do you prepare to capture what you need? That's I, so listening to the song is huge. Like I really try to get the song like before I've even met with the band the first time mm -hmm. like even if it's just a demo recording as long as i can feel like the timing of it yeah. um then i can like spend some time in the mind palace and like just imagine like wow you know what would look cool here if i've seen the band play live that's like even better because then i get a feel for like what their actual vibe is because like mm -hmm. recording or an album it's like maybe you're going for a specific theme here but yeah. like when you play you're doing this thing yeah. Um, like just like like broad research that is very vibes based. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, talking with the band beforehand, trying to get like at least one meeting beforehand of like, because if you can meet with a person and like actually be like, what do you want? And this is a meeting for us to discuss this. Mm. It's like so much more productive than like, hey, I'll make a music vid video for you. I really like this song. Do you have any ideas? And then they're like, whatever you want. And then it's like, well, I've, I'm like in a desert. I'm in a, I'm in a desert of, of concepts now because right. you've given me too much range. You think that uh, in some ways it'd be nice to be told, yeah, whatever you want to do. But <laughs> in reality, it's like I can't, there's no, you need limits and boundaries in order to dream inside of. In I your completely mind palace. agree. Yeah. Um, and so I guess maybe we'll, we'll jump to this uh, collaboration question because it's been interesting for me as I've made more music videos, how important it is to have shared vocabulary for what you're after and sort of just a sense for um how to not go in the wrong direction you know because the artist musician is thinking in musical terms and you're thinking in visual terms and how do you how do you ensure that you're on the same page with those people um showing them like even if it's like kind of a pain and it is almost always for music videos <laughs> to render out the whole oh, video yeah um it's worth it to to spend an afternoon rendering, put it on Google Drive, send it to them, wait a day or two for them to e watch it even, uh, and then get notes. Like, or, uh, you know, if they're local or if you, you can get schedules to line up, it's even better to, like, just show them the project in Premiere and mm -hmm. be like, hey, I have these elements. How can we... Do we like it so far? Yeah. Um, and, like, I do think I've got a pretty good sense of, like... 
getting those elements but like back to what you the question you said before about like how do i know i'm getting the shots Mm -hmm. it's like a lot of doing it shooting like for a two minute song 20 like 23 minutes of footage maybe Mm -hmm. and that's like on on the low end yeah um and then being like okay i'm gonna edit this i'm gonna see how much progress i've made in the edit and then maybe we'll schedule two or three more shoot days based on that yeah that first one that seems to be my experience too is you are making a thing almost it's sort of blindly and amassing a lot of options. Then you get into the booth and you start seeing where the gaps are. Like, oh, missed this one. Got to yeah. go back for that one. Totally. Is, has there ever been a tangle up in one of your collaborations that you could speak to and perhaps listeners could avoid in their own practice like don't do this or has there ever been a time where it like really missed um yeah i've had like one time recently where i did a shoot that i like had done a couple versions of an edit for it was um it was for anyone who's familiar with nick moss or nick mass oh yeah um uh we've done a a lot of projects together at this point we're uh a little bit of a duo um a a 2024 buffalo art duo of of making things uh he's he's got all these ideas and i'm always there to sort of like uh you know make the scaffolding and Mm -hmm. and and to say like oh i love this like here's how we should do that and we shot a video at amy's place which was super fun Mm -hmm. easily one of the most fun video shoots i've had uh and like finding the timing in the edit was just like really a struggle like it was Mm -hmm. like we had so much i think we had shot two hours of footage for that one Mm -hmm. and it's like a four minute song oh yeah and it's it's a similar thing where it's like you get to a point where you have you almost can almost have too much footage and then it's like okay there's four or five concepts in this and we want to use all of them Mm -hmm. but like how do we pare that down how do we make it digestible yeah um and like that's been one that's been on the back burner for a while just because we've been trying to figure out the the minor details of it so the problem hasn't been solved in that edit yet no no that one's still in the still on the cutting room floor as it were yeah i guess that is a risk because like we've said a couple times now you really need a boundary line that is uh, restrained enough to allow you to operate inside of it and whether it's the artist being too open or the footage being too much, it's really, this, this seems like part of uh, the equation for success is to stay limited in what you want to do. Yeah, absolutely. I think that these two music videos actually that we're going to talk about, I think are really good examples of staying limited and like finding the success in that. Yeah, let's talk about them. So first one, we'll go with 100 Plus Club. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what was the song? Remind me that... Uh, all the d- All the... Time I wasted. Okay. All the time I wasted. I, I knew I was gonna stumble over these because they're like four words, <laughs> and it's like I love a I love a long title, but I'm always like, is it all the time or is it all the all the place, all the people, <laughs> whatever it is. We'll we'll all put it in the time I notes. wasted. I'm 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 nearly positive. Okay, cool. And so how if did I got it wrong? I'll, or I'll, the formal notes app apology to a hundred plus <laughs> on my Instagram story the day this comes out. All right, you heard it here, folks. Uh, so how did you devise this video in particular like the way i um sort of interpreted the visual information was like it was a beach hangout on a dreary day (laughs) and uh you know zane the lead singer is like singing into a microphone but there's no stage you know it's kind of got this like interesting juxtaposition to it it sort of feels like almost like a like a beatles uh, behind the scenes thing, but like uh, from some different planet, you know? <laughs> and um, one of the things that stood out to me as far as how you put it together, I mean, we could talk about this, is transitions between scenes seem to be really aided by a glitch effect where you could sort of snap out and back to something that's different. Were you using that selectively or intentionally to sort of like make a bridge to other parts? Yeah, absolutely. The The thing i really liked about that one is they reached out to me and just sent me one of my own instagram reels because i'll for for a that's while cool. i'll make like a little post i'll like make a 30 second chunk of music that's not in any way you know that good <laughs> and then i'll be like this is perfect for a little bit of a b-roll that i shot or something especially last summer i was riding my bike around at night a lot with my video camera and just like recording things oh cool 
Um, and they sent me one of those reels and we're like, we love the look of this. Can we do a video that looks like it? Yeah. And that's like an amazing starting point is like, here's something you've already edited that we like how it looks. Yeah. And the, the big thing of that was like that it was video in video, like smaller videos and layering things. Mm -hmm. So that was sort of the first thing was like, just like, okay, we need a lot of stuff and like a lot of kind of B-roll, a kind of, lot of ambient things. Like, and when I was shooting, I tried really hard to get them like casual, get them candid from, from further away or like things where they're interacting very authentically. How do you create that atmosphere for them? Um, just like not being professional, honestly, <laughs> um, showing up and being like as chill and like normal as possible. Mm. Um, like it, it, being like, yeah, show up, you know, let's just hang out. We're at the beach, man. Like who cares? Yeah. Um, very, like just being very chill, trying to like, and then also like being a person with a camera a lot, I think you get, you find, you get used to finding those moments mm -hmm. where, where people are having their own, our own private spaces. Right. Um, and then just like having the sort of courage <laughs> or maybe, um, voyeurism to be like, I'm going to press record on my camera now while these people are having a, maybe a, an intimate moment. Wow. Um, but it also just was like, I wanted to play with the title all the time I wasted. And mm. it's like, I wanted it to feel like this thing where it's like, man, did, did they shoot this on purpose? Or was this all just like them messing around? I see. It um, has a little bit of a home movies quality. To yeah, it. absolutely. And mm. then, yeah, the, the transitions were having those layers and then doing a, a line of, of exporting the main video, uh, recording it with some glitches on it doing that three or four times uh, with one piece, doing that three or four times with another piece, mm. and then layering those videos on top of each other, finding overlay points, finding like just sections where, oh, this glitch leads well into this footage. And mm -hmm. sometimes even just a crossfade, but like with a little bump or something on top. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of really interesting superimpositions, you know, like 80s looking like fading in and out, uh, you know? Absolutely. And also, you know, you had mentioned the sort of picture-in-picture -picture effect. Was that stuff in the camera you were using, or are you, are you operating in post? A too? lot of that's in post, Okay. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, yeah, the picture-in-picture -picture stuff was all in post, um, and then putting that through analog g gear to, to kind of cook it a little more, I think, oh, okay. is like, especially running it through things that are processing that video as a flat, image mm -hmm. rather than as individual layers um it kind of you get little bits of artifacting uh, between the layers that make it all look like a cohesive piece a little bit more i see uh something like the overlay um of zane's face i think i know this the scene you're talking yeah. about it is very 80s because it's like this singing he's singing and it's all very solid but there's this ethereal uh larger version of him mm. singing above yeah um and that is like i, I love that kind of 80s aesthetic of, of things like that i've, I've want i love that simpler editing effects but like like the twin peaksy like sort yeah. of things it's yeah. like just so so uh impactful are you dealing with uh, a lot of symbolism in th what you're choosing to show? I mean, speaking of Twin Peaks, where you're, there's Easter eggs everywhere, you know, <laughs> but like in this situation, um, there's some spooky quality, some Halloween-y type yeah, things happening. Absolutely. They and, had the, the skull prop, which yeah. I did kind of like get very interested in and was just, I love, um, I think it's like, it probably like wants to be symbolism, but <laughs> also like I'm kind of just doing like a cheaper version of it where I'm like... <laughs> You know what I love in a movie or music video is when there's like a thing, a prop that's in a lot of scenes. And then there's like <laughs> 10 years later, the Facebook meme of like, did you notice the red phone in the background of six scenes? Oh, they made a mistake. And then other people are like, <laughs> actually, it means this very important thing. Um, and like, I love inspiring, like, or like wanting to inspire that sort of stuff. And then like, to the Beatles point, like the yeah. I am the walrus thing of yeah, like, let's I kind am. of also make it nonsense. Like, let's to divert a little bit yeah well so does does the skull mean a thing to you or does it is it more of like a nonsense surreal element surreal i like i think i just like motifs like i mm. love having things that like i can return to in the edit and be like okay like when he's singing to the skull i can like find other moments that kind of like play off of that mm. um 
Also, like there was, they taped some uh, candles into the eyes of the skull, and it just looked so cool on the VHS tape. Yeah. I was like, certain things like that where I'm like, that just is aesthetically great. They kind of um, hundred plus club has been going, and like they've had this goth motif that they're kind of working with that I think is is awesome. Yeah. Um, and it, it felt like a good moment where they were set. I think it was around October too when we shot it. So there was a Halloween vibe. It yeah. felt very fall. It all fit together. Yeah. I think when, if I said, uh, if we didn't have enough beach footage, we would go do the rest in the woods or something. Oh to do yeah. That. That Which fit. would have been the same woods that I shot the St. Blind video in probably. Is that Hamburg beach that you're on? It was, um, Went beach actually. Went so beach. it's like a little further down from Hamburg. Oh, um, okay. but it's like, a it's a little more private and like, I quite like it. It has like this old, uh, building, uh, on the top of a hill, which oh. I think is very pretty. Yeah. Cool. Um, there's one thing I need to mention, perhaps my favorite effect in the video, mm. is at the end where the silhouettes are filled with the water background. Yeah. How did you achieve that? Um, that was, uh, like, they were, uh, they had a, a light. They had, like, this uh, Best Buy $50 LED panel, which I only found out, like, when they had it, uh, they were using it. They brought, they were, we'll have lighting stuff. And I was like, awesome, it will get dark. <laughs> yeah. um, and this is a this is a VHS camera. Like the exposure settings are, are <laughs> cool, but it's going to get blown out immediately. Yeah. So um, lighting would be perfect. Uh, and then, so they we were able to get these really bright lights. Uh, and then um, they stood in front of each other, in front of this wall and kind of like did an, oh goodness, they did an arm movement. They stood in front of this wall and did an arm movement. And um, the the combination of their arms moving created that six armed silhouette. Oh. And then I just keyed that out with the footage behind them. Mm. And then, um, yeah, at the very end, there's that delayed uh, bit where like they're moving and it, the colors and, and everything follows yeah. them. That's so awesome. And yeah, that part I think was just um, playing that video with like a minor bit of feedback, but like not so much that any, and then like a heavy amount of delay, like probably four seconds of delay or something. Okay. Uh, so that the colors are, are still adjusting, but like pretty much on like a green or not green on a blue orange spectrum. Hmm. And then, yeah, there's that little bit where Brock's head moves at the, the corner. And it is like one of my favorite visuals in the whole thing. It's Cause so it's good. so impactful. Yeah. Now, you said that the woods where you filmed this next video we're going to talk about are right nearby where you filmed 100 Plus Club. And I guess in a general way, I'm curious, do you ever worry about or try and avoid replicating styles or visuals or backgrounds that you've used previously? Are you like actively like someone says, oh, I love that beach. You're like, eh, I've done the beach thing. And um. Mm, I not really because I th I think that the beauty of Buffalo is that when you work with a different artist, it, mm. they're bringing such a radically different musical vibe. Yeah. If it was like a band that also did like a uh, indie goth like <laughs> song that was about um, all the time they wasted, I'd be like, yeah, maybe not that. Um, <laughs> a little too specific. A little on too the on the nose. Yeah, but also at the same time, maybe then it would be kind of like interesting it's <laughs> yeah. like i can make an anthology about like oh, uh, there you go. the the indie goth beach or whatever oh that'd be cool um and i think <laughs> i guess that helps too is that whenever i think of something like that my brain goes in one direction or the other where it's like we either got to go all the way with it or we should avoid it right um but yeah i think that i think that also like I have enough shot ideas in my head where like, at least not right now, I'm worried. I'm not too worried about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, you're absolutely right about how each artist is going to completely uh, differently influence the vibe of what you're after. And so you might be in the same spot, but it might look completely different. Yeah. I, I, their energy is going to change it yeah. in, a, in a pretty radical way. Okay. I'm glad you mentioned this because the energy shift between these two videos was noticeable to me. In some of the camera work, it mm. seemed like there were way more static shots or maybe even tripoded shots in the St. Blind video and 100 plus felt like freehand. It's movement. like all steady cam for the 100 plus club video. And yeah. yeah, there was a lot of I think it was a lot of tripods, a lot of like stable shots for 100, a lot of like slow zooms because mm -hmm. I, 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 I that was the, the main shot idea I had in my head for for which video for the St. Blind for video. Bli it was right, a lot yes. of tripods and these zooms. like zooming in and out kind of slowly. Yeah. So how did you develop like what made you say for this one? We want static and zoom. We don't want the freehand as much. Um, 
part of it is that it was the video I did after 100 Plus Club. So okay. there was a part of me that was like, I'm always trying to do another thing. It's the t- changing the TV channel is yeah. kind of, I guess, how I would phrase it. Uh, where it's like, you know, this was good, but what's on what's on channel four? <laughs> um, Twilight Zone, awesome. <laughs> and that was this video. Yeah. Uh, and it was like, yeah, I think also um, there's something about uh, Aaron's voice in it that's very like, uh, like melodic. It's very rhythmic. Mm-hmm. Um, there was something about the whole thing that just felt like, like it was being aggressive. It was very uh, da- looking down the barrel of the camera. Mm, yeah, and he's um, kind of locked, right? His eyes are locked, right? In yeah, the his eyes are locked in, and it feels like that in the song very much. It feels like this thing's kind of just coming at you steadily, mm. um, and emotionally too. There, the, there is like a distance and a coldness as well, and it was kind of like working with all of those, and also again. The time of the time of year and stuff like, was that also a fall shoot that was that was the next month so i think it was like oh. a little deeper into fall a little closer to the actual it was a lot rainier <laughs> yeah there's some there's a little bit more uh brightness that i noticed though in the saint blind one or perhaps it's just like angle of the sun coming through um yeah there's like a, a little bit of warmth to the video which is strange because it's cold, dead, staring eyes, you know? It's yeah. a really interesting way to play with those two things. Um, you also are doing some picture-in-picture in, picture in that one as well, right? Yeah, that one was, um, was w- there was some picture-in-picture picture elements. Um, having just come off the 100 Plus Club thing, I was like, maybe this is my style. Yeah. Uh, and then also there was some like projector-in-picture elements, which I oh. had a lot of fun with. What, what does that mean exactly? How, um, how does that work? That's, uh, it's not, I made it up just now, so don't want <laughs> to feel bad about not knowing what it means. Um, it was me recording a video with a projector on the, the wall, and the projector was playing a portion of the video that I had already edited. Oh. So it was like, I like this part of the video. I wanted to shoot more but I didn't want to necessarily lose that part. Mm-hmm. And I also wanted to keep playing with the picture and picture stuff. Yeah. So I had Aaron sit in front of the projector. So he's silhouetted or like hit by the light mm-hmm. and then do the performance, but like with himself performing behind it, which was oh, that's pretty very interesting. cool. Yeah. Yeah. The, the idea of using a projector it is like a really interesting way to play with your like in camera effect which can then be adjusted in post Absolutely. to your liking. Taking it back to King Kong. Yeah, exactly. I just did one for Stress Dolls, a music video where um, I had Chelsea, the lead singer down here, and we were. U- I had gone to Dave and & Buster's, and I walked around and filmed really close up like lights flashing. Mm, there's all these flashing lights. So in many. It. And then slow-moed all the lights, and then spun them like orientation Uh and then i projected them on chelsea while she sang the song and filmed that that's awesome very 60s yeah right it created such a cool vibe that you i don't think i could have ever achieved just by you know premiere premiering my way along yeah you could get that with an overlay effect because you're going to get that digitization of like you can see that it's half opacity on the frame right instead of like the cameras getting these value shifts on the actual person in the space this brings to mind a question like how do you feel people are perceived the like infrastructure of what you're making like do you think that anyone like that isn't in this game would know if they saw opacity (laughs) like you know or is it just people that like really do this um i there's definitely a point where it gets like like truly a little like a to use a modern term brain rotted where (laughs) where i will go to shows and part of me will will not be able to enjoy the concert as much because I'm like, oh, their VJ is just using Resolum? Nice. Cool. Good software plug-in, dude. Uh, which is like totally dismissive because um, Resolume's great and a very useful software. But uh, the whole time I'm just thinking like, yeah, I could create this with an analog inline and like uh, adjusting the Z-axis on, on, a, on a 3D projection plane of the video. This would be like, this guy's a total dork for using his built-in software with audio reactive element. Like, See, it's a totally different experience like uh, for you <laughs> and when you know like what's possible and for a viewer who sees it as this chunked up thing that they can't break the pieces apart. I- inversely, people will see uh, what I'm doing and be like, uh, oh, is there a, a computer doing that? Oh, really? Um, so they think it's like... Yeah, especially because I use like a, a na- Korg Nano Controller mm-hmm. for a lot of my stuff. People will come up to me and like a- uh, address me like I'm the sound guy. 
Ah, yeah, <laughs> they'll be right. like, can we get more? Can we get more uh, mic and and speaker too? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't. I wouldn't know where to start with that. Yeah, not my department. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm doing the pretty colors on the <laughs> ceiling actually. Yeah, that's really cool. Um, one thing I love about these videos is that each one has a. I'm going to call it a post-credits scene, totally. but um, it's kind of just the music has faded away, but we're still there. And it creates, I talk about a sort of a sense of voyeurism or like just this uh, looking behind the veil. It's a feeling for the audience, I think, that is missing from a lot of music videos. Totally. Is that something you always do? How did you decide to do it? Does it happen naturally? That was so something I decided. I think I've done it in a lot of the muddle music videos. It's like something that I really love because exactly. It's like this very cathartic moment where, you know, in, in live music, when the band finishes a song, you get 30 seconds of respite yeah. where it's like you get to see them, you know, adjusting for the next song they're about to play. And and you feel more connected to them maybe as people in that mm. moment than as performers. Um uh, very Brechtian, you know, dramaturgy, uh, <laughs> taking that step back to be like, hey, this is a thing that's happening. We've got to do something about it. Right. Um, and yeah, I love I love creating. I love having those moments. Anytime I get to see that in media, it's very cathartic. It's very impactful. And I love like creating those moments. And like I shoot so much footage that there's always like little bits where I'm like, this is just super cute. This yeah. is just like really <laughs> lovely. Uh, Brock with the skull head doing this like arm filling moment. I'm like, well, if I can't find a moment where this fits in the song, I've got to throw it in at the yeah, end. Yeah, definitely. And it also creates a nice moment for me to throw my little credit video made by Silas Rubeck. Yeah. Because um, it, it does like also draw attention to the fact that it is a production yeah, as well. Somebody made this Something's thing. making it, yeah. It's also, uh, I thought that maybe you would be deciding based on, because um, you're shooting audio with your visual and maybe there's some times where I think at the end of St. Blind, there's like some speaking part that's like kind of a jokey thing that happens. And so I was wondering if you capture all this audio and then one time you hear something funny and you're like, oh. I'm going to throw that at the that end. That so is also it. very common. Like <laughs> yeah. it's it's one of three. It's like either the shot is very pretty and goes on for like a nice chunky five seconds where mm. I'm just like, that's like, man, I really had that still. There's like a, a, a video I did for Nick where it's him standing and it's like, you're mostly seeing a field of flowers kind of in front of him. Um, and he says something, but it's totally like, like uh, secondary. It's totally tertiary to what's, the, the focal point, which is the, the wind and the flowers and things right. like that. Similar with the, the St. Blind thing. It's like there's the audio where it's like him pointing out this book. It was, uh, I want to say like 1984. He's or like, maybe, go over in that drawer. Open he, that drawer. He's, oh, open the cover. Look at the, it was it was a, a book, I think 1984 or maybe um, Fahrenheit 451. Okay. Like from eight years after it had been released it was like was so like early such an oh. old copy it was very cool nice uh and he was pointing that out to me and like i think in that one i like that i make uh like the dark crystal sound like i make the chamber i do like the chamberlain oh <laughs> yeah. kind of sound at the end <laughs> yeah and i think that got stuck in my head for a little while and i was like i'll throw you know what have a little humility i'll, I'll throw that in there yeah that was great i love that moment how about um cut times like uh I find that, speaking of shooting a lot of footage, that when you're making a music video, the speed with which you're cutting is like fast and furious compared to the speed of a short film where you can have long sections of no cutting. Absolutely, yeah. And do you have like a set way of, you know, are you hitting the downbeat in the song? Are you avoiding the song's rhythm altogether and doing sort of uh, more visual language? How do you handle that part? Um, when I first started doing music videos in like Windows Media Maker, um, I was super beat centered. It was very mm. like, there's going to be a cut here regardless. Yeah. Um, and I think it was around the St. Blind video where I was like, you know what? It's okay to linger. Like it's okay mm. to sit on something for a moment because you kind of are making a short film. And if you treat it like that, like with the Saint Blind video, I treated it a lot more like a short film. I think, mm -hmm. uh, at least in like the structuring of it, where I I had a lot more moments where it was like, okay, there's a couple seconds where there's just a beat here. Um, I could cut. I could do things that are a little more uh, dopaminergic and that are gonna really grab people the whole time. Yeah. Or I can like let it sit. And then when it fades into the, the the melody, 
or when the melody kicks back in, that's when I'll cut. And then there's something to, to that effect. Mm. Uh, I was rewatching the hundred plus club video and like the first time they do the chorus, um, is when Zane is singing to the skull. And I liked that shot of him singing to the skull enough where it was like, I could boost the saturation right then, or like do a hard cut to like just his face in the frame or something. Mm -hmm. But I still kind of chose to like let it build a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's something I've been like unlearning, but also like working on other videos where people are like, I would like there to be more cuts. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I'm like, that's totally fair. It's like finding the the sweet spot a lot because there is that dopaminergic element where people want us to just hit the whole time and be. That's what I think about. Yeah, I think about that a lot is. I've shown them a half a second of visual information. They're probably ready for the next half a second, which is like, ah, sometimes it's hard if you do capture something beautiful and you're like, yeah, I need to give this time. Sometimes in the plot of the video, you need to give it time. Like here's, here's the moment where the character is like resting. So you can't just be like, tap, 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 tap. Yeah, I think the glitches do help with that a lot, too, Mm because you can have longer shots. But if things are bopping and glitching and bouncing, um, oh, yeah, it it, it still does. It resets the brain a little bit. Yeah. Uh, And then you can you can kind of move from that point and be like, okay, that gives me five seconds of video time. But I like (laughs) cranked this knob and and turned on an oscillator so that this happened. Or I like put it through the dirty mixer so that it like Mm. looks like really VHS y. What's your tolerance for films that are, so kind of moving away from music videos for a second, films that are just like slow burning, like I'm thinking of Tarkovsky, Stalker, like it's a long ride, you know, do you? I love a John Dealman. Yeah, frankly. comfortable with I, it? I, I, I actually have a friend that like is my, my I would say my non-art scene like friend like the person where when i'm like the hyper reality of being an artist is getting a little much we need to smoke weed in your garage and watch some movies <laughs> yeah like that's my friend david and i will go to his house oh, cool. um and I, i'm always bringing vhs tapes over i'm always like let's watch this let's watch this and he made a comment recently where he was like why is every movie that you bring over a hundred minutes long <laughs> So I love, I I actually like love a movie that goes for way longer than it should. Yeah. Uh, Face Off is a good example. John Travolta? John Travolta, Nick Cage. Nick Cage. It probably could be, you know, an hour 20, but it's like two hours and 30 minutes long. Oh, they committed for that They one. really like, there's like a halfway point where they're like, the plot is essentially done, but there's a lot more movie <laughs> left. A lot more action to do. Yeah. And then of course, that's the movie where like the, the finger goes down the face or whatever. Absolutely. Travolta does that yeah. like, very creepy yeah. move. Yeah. There's a lot of uh, John Travolta to being creepy in that movie but it's because he's got the brain of nick cage so <laughs> so we have to understand gotta understand is, yeah and apparently they didn't like each other so the whole movie is them just like doing imp- mean impressions of one another kind oh of, my god really? which adds a definitely adds a layer to yeah. it yeah wow i never knew that i love that i love that bit of trivia i love movie trivia it's great um so We've talked about what you made. What are you making coming up, uh, whether you're in the process now or it's just like a sparkle in your eye? What's uh, on your mind for the future? (laughs) Oh, man, I've got my fingers in so many pies at the moment. Um, Me and Nick, uh, as I mentioned, have many projects, uh, namely uh, Vague Questions, which is through the Generator Fund and Beka School. which is an interview series we're doing where we're talking to basically like everyone and we can find in Buffalo, mostly artistic people. Cause those are the ones that we have connections to, but like I've been really adamant about like trying to get like a community center senior home, like other places to do these Rorschach type, uh, interviews. Rorschach interview. Like you're looking at an ink block. There's ink like, blocks. And then, um, there's a, sort of I what I've been referring to very pretentiously as an autodidactic interview or a self-contained interview where we have a, a stack of CRT TVs with a PowerPoint presentation on it and the person is given a, a clicker and a microphone that's going into my laptop mm. and then it's also being there's a video element that gets recorded onto VHS which uh, I've been really enjoying um, learning the follies of recording the things on the VHS and having to be like, yeah, we lost two interviews because oh, it was on channel two instead of channel three. Um, but 
uh, so they record the interview by themselves. The questions are all asked by the TVs, mm. and then their answers are recorded. Yeah. So it's sort of a an interview Schrodinger's cat, where I don't know what anyone has said until I listen to the interview. That's like um, Errol Morris he has an approach like that, except it twice removed in your case, because he'll be in a different room, I think, and not behind the camera. And like they have an earpiece. Are you familiar with his work? I'm not. Um, I'm trying to think of like a movie you'd know. Vernon, Florida is the one that comes to mind, but there's like so many. <laughs> but uh, great documentarian and really interesting to put people in a interview position that's that's so unconventional. I think interviews, like we're doing one right now, so this is a little meta, but are tough because you are expected to say something and it's not just the normal flow of conversation where you can jump in when you want. It's like, if I'm not talking and you're not talking, well, what are we doing? <laughs> You've got to cut that whole part out. That's like a... Oh, gosh, it's 30 seconds of editing at least to, <laughs> to cut that silence out. The amount of ums and uhs that I've dropped on this, it's like an hour for you at least today. <laughs> I usually leave them in. That's yeah. my thing is I'm like That's trying real. to do as little editing on these as possible because making them is, uh, is a commitment, you know, like just finding time for yeah, us to both sit down. and stuff. And then it's like, oh, if I got into the weeds on, you know, spending a couple hours like cleaning up every little yeah. pop and like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I love a co podcast that's just a conversation too. Those are like my favorite to listen to, where it's yeah. like I can kind of just like hear a like a like I love list I love conversations in general, and it's nice to not always have to be a part of them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that, like that's the beauty of a podcast. It's like yeah, I can exactly. just be I can be at a party and like eavesdropping on these three people as they have like a great conversation. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's partially it's like watching a movie where uh, you can stare at someone's face. Yeah. Um, without any discomfort. That's you know? a very good, that's so true, actually. That's <laughs> I very think interesting. a lot of people get into movies subconsciously for that reason. It's just like they're really captivated. But uh, yeah, we've we've covered what I want to cover, but I want to end by saying um, what I said in the beginning, really, which is just I'm a huge fan of your work. Mm -hmm. I don't really know anyone around here that's um, pulling off the kind of stuff you are. I think you have a great mind for it. Every time I show up at a show and you're there, I'm like, yes. Uh -huh. Like, I don't even, music could be whatever, but now I know it's going to be, like, really exciting to be, uh, participate in this artistic exchange. So thank you for what you do and keep doing it. Thank you so much. I would say you were my first, arguably my first fan in the city. I did a, a flyer for a muddle show at, at Sugar City once, rest in peace. Yeah. And I you think. talked to me outside of the show about it for, like, 10 minutes. And that was one of the very formative moments in Buffalo uh, where I was like, oh, wow, I can make art that impacts other people. So that was pretty cool. <laughs> you have a real gift, and it definitely caught me you know, from the <laughs> beginning. And I'm sure many, many others. So I'm excited to kind of uh, lift up the stuff you're doing, and hopefully this podcast will put you in touch with new collaborators and new viewers. And Yeah, absolutely. Kind of hit me up. I am very reasonable about pricing. I How don't they hit like money. Uh, Instagram, at Sils the Schmuck, uh, yeah, underscores, S-I-L-S underscore the underscore schmuck. Uh, or my email, silasrubeck at gmail.com. That's all lowercase, S-I-L-A-S-R-U-B-E-C-K at gmail.com. Very cool. Thank you, Silas. Yeah, thank you. This was great. I really enjoyed it.